We all have a story to tell, and your story matters. Now more than ever, that's why we've created Cine Youth Fest. A cinema festival and a platform for independent voices, positive change, stories of heroism from the lens of a Latinx experience. Join the adventure on our website, cineyouthfest.org. There, you will find all you need to participate in the competition. The rules of the game, Latinx and film, where you find out how important we really are. Classes behind the camera with people who know. Stories from others like you who have a dream, big ideas, and awesome goals. Raise your voice to be heard. Show off to be seen. And be part of history sharing your story. Lights, camera, acción. Because tú cuentas. Powered by H-E-T-N. Hello, everyone. Oh, my goodness. There you are. Oh, thank you all so much for joining us for our third installment of Conversations Among X. Yes, third. Uh, Conversations Among X, if you don't know, are a series of panels that, you know, just casually highlight the incredible talents and experiences of Latinx creatives all across the U.S. Oh, my gosh. Um, Conversations Among X is a part of Cine Youth Fest, which is an online film festival that makes all kinds of events, and they are actually powered by HITN or HITN, which is the Hispanic Information Telecommunications Network. Fun fact, they are the largest non-commercial Spanish language television network in the U.S. Oh my goodness, but who am I? Very good question. I am Lorena, and I will be moderating today's panel, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you like to look at Weird Al Yankovic all day. Okay, it's sad, but it's true. Today's panel specifically is gonna be all about addressing Latinx invisibility. And we have four wonderful, wonderful panelists who are gonna be sharing their experiences and their thoughts. But before I bring them out, just a little bit of housekeeping, you know, in case you blinked, we are on the internet, okay? This is live, but it's not physically live. So if there are any technological glitches or anything that goes on, we just ask for a little bit, as my mother likes to say, paciencia por favor. Um, but with that in mind, I am going to introduce us to the first person in the panel, which is me. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, I have a bio package and it's going to be embarrassing for me, but we're going to start off by getting to know a little bit about me because you have to trust the person running this ship and the way to trust is get to know a little bit about them. Um, so here is my bio package. My name is Lorena. I am a full-time comedian and filmmaker. I am Latina and I'm queer. I'm a, a lady, you know, right at the edge, but I'm a, I'm a woman. That's Tova. Wow. I used to play soccer professionally because uh, stereotypes come in one size. Um, <laughs> mm, wow, such a good time. Wow. So much fun. Oh, man. Okay, but guys, enough about me. Let's move on to the real intellectuals of this panel, which are our speakers. And our very first speaker and guest is the wonderful Adrian Roman. And here is his bio package. Adrián Viajero Román's work is informed by issues of race, migration, and identity, while exploring both the personal and historical memory of the two disparate worlds that he inhabits, the tropical landscape of Puerto Rico and the overpopulated cityscape of New York. His practice combines drawing, painting, sculpture within immersive installation environments, composed of objects collected from different communities, from salvaged wood and window frames to historic artifacts and vintage photographs. 
The resulting environments can fill an entire wall or an entire room and often incorporate sound and aromatics that draw upon the history and memory embedded in these objects. He is interested in the continuity of time and in how these interventions may bring these living histories forward to the present. Adrián Viajero Román is a time traveler. Puerto Rico. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Adrián to say hello. Um, oh, Adrián, there you are. Hi. Hey, everybody. Um, Adrián, hey. aside from being a time traveler, what is another fun fact uh, about you that you can share with the people? Oh, uh, fun fact, I would say. Um, uh, oh, man, that was a, a good one. Oh, I'm a... I'm a very proud dad of two girls, so that's a uh, yes. That's a good answer. Ah, uh, whatever. You're a good person, I guess, Adrian. That's really the fun fact. He's a good person. <laughs> well, thank you, Adrian, for for being here. Um, I'm also. I'm going to introduce the next speaker uh, and panelist that we're going to have for today, and that is Dr. Raquel Ortiz. Um, and this is Raquel's uh, bio video package. Dr. Raquel M. Ortiz is an anthropologist, educator, and award-winning children's book author. Her scholarship focuses on the visual arts, culture, literature, music, and identity, and includes El Arte de la Identidad, Aproximación Crítica al Jibarismo Puertorriqueño en la Literatura, la Música y las Obras de Arte, and the documentary Memories on the Wall, Education and Enrichment Through Community Murals. Her first picture book, Sophie and the Magic Musical Mural, published by Arte Public Press, was named an ILBA, Best Educational Children's Picture Book. A number of her books explore music and culture, including Sophie Paints Her Dreams, that features merengue music, and When Julia Danced Bomba, a junior library guild selection. Her newest book, Vicky and a Summer of Change, shares what happened in East Harlem, New York, in 1969, when members of the Young Lords organization united with El Barrio residents to make positive changes in their neighborhood. And everyone, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Raquel Ortiz. Hey, Lorena. Hi, everyone. Hey. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Uh, Dr. Raquel, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I have to show you all of my rashes. Um, but Dr. Ortiz, what is a fun fact about you? All right. I also have two children like Adrian. <laughs> and unlike Adrian, I, I love art. I love to make art and I wish I could be as talented as him. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is great. I mean, you have a lot, you are surrounded by a lot of art. So I feel like you're doing great uh, already. <laughs> well, thank you again for being here. I'm really excited to ask you some questions. Um, but I'm gonna introduce our next speaker and panelist. I know, can you believe there's more There's more than two? Um, and this next person is Rina Valentin. Here is Rina's bio video package. Rina Valentin, nicknamed La Reina del Barrio, is a native New Yorker of Puerto Rican descent and a television host focused on lifting human-centered stories with an eye towards fostering empathy and community bridge building. A beloved spokesperson for her community, she is making a mark in New York City's entertainment industry for her unique approach to advocating for and celebrating diversity. Born in East Harlem, Rina, a longtime community resident, is wildly known for her work since 2006 as a host of Bronx Nets Open Friday, a recipient of the 2020 All-Inclusive Changemaker Award and a 25 Bronx Influential Women of 2015 Award. Rina is the founder of La Reina del Barrio, Inc. A fervent practitioner of transcendental meditation, Rina is an active supporter of the arts and believes that the underpinning of the economic health of a community requires support for small and local New York businesses. She also uses her platform to shine a light on pressing social issues, such as domestic violence and holistic mental health needs. Presently, she is part of a fundraising initiative for STEAM educational children's programs in Puerto Rico, Colombia, and West Africa. Recently, Rina Valentin was the first Afro-Latina woman to be named New Yorker for New York. April was her month. Oh, my goodness. New Yorker for New York. Everyone, please welcome Rina Valentin. <laughs> Hi, Thank Rina. You. Oh, my goodness. Rina, I mean, listen, Dr. Ortiz wanted to make art. You look like you're coming from inside of a painting is where... <laughs> <laughs> you look well, life great. Is art. Life is like, oh, I give up. Okay, great. <laughs> um, Rena, what is a fun fact about you? Well, like our fellow panelists that have already spoken, I am the proud mom of, of an 11 years young 
young lady named Charviva. And in addition to that, I want to share that um, my first television appearance uh, was um, when I was eight years old in East Harlem on the original uh, movie Gloria. And I also appeared on The oh. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Okay. Wow. That's a fun, those are fun, fun facts. What were you in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? In the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I was yeah. one of the college students when they would oh go to college. Oh, my gosh. I'm oh not my gosh. myself. I'm dating myself. No, that's okay. No, listen, I love that. I, you know, in a lot of ways, I like to think I am the Fresh Prince, but I'm, you know, not a, a stinkier version. Uh, those are great fun facts, Rena. Thank you so, so much. Um, and then last but not least, everyone, I'm going to introduce the wonderful, our fourth panelist, and that is Waldo Cabrera. And here is Waldo's bio video package. Waldo Cabrera is a two-time Emmy-nominated journalist with over 30 years of professional advertising and marketing experience. After getting an advertising degree from Syracuse University, Waldo joined 4Kids Entertainment, the company that brought Pokemon to the United States. In 2009, Verizon added Waldo's online news program to its Fios One news channel. Over an eight-year run, Waldo produced over 1,200 episodes that focused on outstanding people in the community. He continued telling the stories within the Hispanic community as the head of the media unit at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Cooney Hunter College. Oh, yay, CUNY. Um, okay, everyone, please welcome Waldo Cabrera. Hey, hello, hello. Oh, my goodness. It's like it's a real live show. We're seeing <laughs> hundreds of people, Waldo. <laughs> Waldo, I know your fun fact, um, but can you tell everyone what your fun fact is? Oh, I, I think it's fun to tell people that I ran with the Bulls in Pamplona. Oh, my that, gosh. That was uh, It took me 72 hours for my heart to come down and for me to actually be able to rest well enough to sleep. <laughs> but how did you even get – how did you get there? Well, like, um, how did you I, run I have, with the Bulls? Some of my best friends uh, live in Pamplona, so um, I oh. told them that I wanted to run with the Bulls, so – you know, you kind of like stay up all night and at six in the morning, then, you know, you run, you run with the bulls. It's really, it's really odd how easy it is to get in there and how dangerous it is. There's, they don't check ID. They don't check to see if your leg is well, if you got like a Charlie horse, they don't, they don't check anything. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I can't believe uh, they don't yeah. check for any of that. Well, listen, Waldo, speaking of running with the bulls, and this is a perfect segue, I'm going to bring all of our panelists out here so that we can get our conversation started. So please welcome again, Adrian Roman. We have Dr. Raquel Ortiz. We have Rina Valentin. And again, Waldo Cabrera. So here's everyone coming back. Hi, everyone. Look, it's like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> Um, and just a reminder again, for anyone who just joined us, you are watching Conversations Among X, which is part of CNET Youth Fest. And today's panel is all about discussing invisibility with uh, Latinx artists. So that's what we're going to talk about. And our leading statement that we have, and I want to make sure I get this right, is that it's Latinx artists often feel invisible in their artistic world. The invisibility of Latinx artists is everyone's concern. So with that said, uh, I'm going to start off with our first question. And I'm actually, you know, I want everyone to discuss this. I'm going to have Waldo start. Um, but have you guys ever felt invisible as artists? The the interesting thing is that I've had a great platform ever since I graduated high uh, college. I've I worked with Pokemon. I worked with some really large uh, companies that gave me a big voice. So I was used to just being able to be seen and, and help my clients mm -hmm. uh to be seen. And then I moved to Long Island. And on Long Island, we only have a one TV station and one uh, newspaper for 3 million people. And it and, and if anything positive, anyone in the community has something to say, you just, it was nearly impossible to get your voice out. And that, that felt really isolating for me. Someone that was mm -hmm. that's been used to working with the daily news and, and the big media outlets in New York City, just to be literally isolated and um and i and it, it was just it, it was just overwhelming so i decided to start my long island tv to solve the issue but it, it took years and and just to realize that three million people only have one newspaper and one tv station to get the voice out and you know if you ever want to make anyone invisible do that to three million people mm. 
And what about you, Raquel? Because obviously, you know, I feel like with your book specifically, they're coming from a really personal place. Did that come from just a desire of like, I no longer want to be invisible? Right. Well, I was thinking about that. I think when I confirmed my invisibility, I was taking a class at School of Visual Arts and mm. an author came in to talk about the color of children's publishing. And she let us know that there's only about 6% of Latinx and Kitty Lit publishing. And then she gave us information of other places to look to find out more. And there's a, a place at the University of Wisconsin that has the Cooperative Children's Book Center. And this year, there were 228 books written by Latinx people and 200 books about Latinx people. So my stories are very personal. It's sometimes hard to sell those stories because we are in a market that wants to make a profit. And we are, <laughs> not only are we invisible, but people are taking our stories and using it and they're writing the story. So others are writing our stories. So I think that's, that's almost as dangerous as being invisible. Hmm. And Rena, what, what about you? Have you ever felt invisible as an artist? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I still feel invisible. <laughs> as invisible as I am, I still feel invisible. It's unbelievable, you know. I, I, I you know, I want to say that I feel invisible mostly because um, I, um, being in the public's eye, let's say, right, oh, and um, based on the work that I do, I am a platform that offers my community uh, documentation. Um, because I'm on a local level, I, I, mm. I sometimes wish that I, well, not that I sometimes wish, I do wish that we as a community understood that although I'm broadcast on a local level, I'm also on the World Wide Web, which allows us a broader audience. But because we're not a national network, there's limitations. And so before even being on air and still feeling invisible, many, many years ago, as I mentioned, I was on the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, um, and I, you know, I want to aim. I want to say more or less, possibly 25 years ago. Um, you know, I was out there uh, auditioning and pursuing acting, and mm. my agent at the time was really sending me out to anything that fell under the description of exotic. Right? Um, they mm -hmm. didn't know what Puerto Ricans were at the time that I was there. Um, and so I felt really displaced and, um, it was just an awkward place to be in, in recognizing my own identity and or defending it. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. I can relate more on that when you and me, uh, get drinks at some point. <laughs> but Adrian, uh, I'm talking to everyone here about invisibility as an artist. And, you know, I want to ask you, I want to round out this question. Have you ever felt invisible as an artist? Um, Yes, just like everyone said, yes, um, mm -hmm. I have. Um, my, my, my story, I feel like, um, is twofold. I, I want to also highlight the visibility that I experienced because I think mm -hmm. my, my consciousness of my invisibility came through um, my Puerto Rican communities that kind of gave me that visibility um, as I was coming up in my art career. Um, mm -hmm. The places that made me uh, feel connected and, and feel seen and um, and that were familiar to me, right? So like El Museo de Barrio, Taller Boricua, uh, New York and Poets Cafe, these, these were all places very early in my art career that that um, I saw myself and, mm. and it, it actually helped push me forward. But it wasn't until I wanted to expand outside of that um, that I started to witness our invisibility and, and one of the, the biggest um, moments in my life that were, it was a great, probably my greatest achievement in my artistic career was also the biggest uh, highlight to me of our invisibility. And it was, mm -hmm. I was exhibiting at the Smithsonian um, Museum for National Portrait Gallery. Uh, I was in a portrait competition. I did a beautiful portrait installation of a mm -hmm. uh, black Puerto Rican uh, woman and her story. And uh, it was a proud moment. It was a proud moment for that art. It was a proud moment for our community. It was a proud moment for her family that they got to see that piece of art hanging at the Smithsonian. But the attention that we got 
it was so profound that it almost was surreal of, of like why I, I, you know, we appreciate it and it's great, but why are we getting it so much is because mm -hmm. we're not actually seeing that much. So once right. you see it at this level and introducing our culture and our stories to people who have never even heard of us and where we come from, um, right. it, it kind of highlighted for me, especially when it started to travel around to different parts of the country to uh, museums on the West Coast and Washington and North Carolina. Yeah. And so in, the, in those places, yeah. it, it really emphasized um, our, our invisibility. Yeah. No, and I think, Adrienne, you said, you know, you talked about consciousness and that really beautifully brings me to this next question that I have for everyone, which is like thinking about how there's been more of a social movement and there is this sort of quote unquote global consciousness among the community. You know, you look at things like Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, Oscar's so white. And yet, despite having all this quote unquote consciousness, the Latinx population continues to still be invisible in media. So I, I want to start with Rena, and I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts. You know, why do you guys think this is happening? Why do you guys think that we continue to be invisible in media? Well, I mean, I'm going to speak on behalf of media because that's what, <laughs> that's the field I'm in. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I want to start by saying, I think that because there are multiple Latin networks and award show that the American Latinx gets overlooked. I want to start there. And then I also feel that I think that we need to merge into the English speaking networks in larger numbers. Um, we need to be in the decision making rooms on, of how we want to be represented. As we mentioned earlier, we need to be the writers, we need to be the producers, we need to be the directors, we need to be the editors. And, mm -hmm. and we also need to be on the boards of the Oscars and the National Academy of Television Arts and Science and the Tonys and the Grammys. Um, we, we need to really take control of our narrative, but we also also need to understand the importance of supporting our stories. So um, mm -hmm. there's multiple levels in which there's a lot of work that still needs to get done. 100%. Becca, do you see that then as well in terms of in books when you're when you're writing? Do you feel like we are invisible in that market as well, like or um, or do you not see that? Oh, we definitely are, <laughs> and okay. we, we definitely need to do more. I am happy to say that I don't know if anyone followed the whole controversy with American Dirt that happened a mm -hmm. couple of years ago, and it was the good thing that came out of it is there was a very huge pushback by Latinx writers. And there's now a movement called hashtag um, Dignidad Literaria or hashtag literary dignity. And they have been able to get the really big publishing houses to sit down at the table with them and to commit to writing some of these wrongs. And in my personal case, I published with Arte Publico Press, which is from University of Houston. It's a very small editorial house that's bilingual with their children literature and just publishes Latino authors, Latinx authors. So I'm living like the two worlds because we have, like Rina had mentioned, we have certain spaces that cultivate and protect us and promote us. But then there's all these other spaces where there's so many gatekeepers and then worse yet, you know, other people telling our stories in really questionable and or bad ways. Hmm. You know, I wanted to uh, to point out that in, in a way being invisible, uh, some of the the, the uh, topics that you, you spoke about, uh, let's say Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement and, and uh, Oscar So White and a lot of the, and, and the age, violence against Asians, that those are very negative and, uh, and traumatic uh, events in, in, in those communities. And in a way, it's a good thing that Latinos are not known for that because that, you know, the last thing I want to do is be visible because of something tragic and, and some kind of, of, of uh, crazy um, wrong injustice that's being done to, to our community. But, you know, um, we do have to figure out how to become visible for more positive things and, uh, and, and telling our stories in, in television and in books is, is part of it. So we have to, uh, I do agree that we do have to take charge of, of telling our, our own story. And it's something that, you know, I did uh, in 2007 when I decided that since anytime anyone showed up in the Bronx where I lived or in Brentwood where I live right now, 
the only time you would see the big uh, networks come up is when somebody got shot, there was a murder, you know, some some mm -hmm. something ridiculously, you know, uh, negative. If it bleeds, it leads. So I just felt that that was not the way that our community uh, should be seen. And and I started my own network with the strict focus on on telling the story of our people. And and eventually it um, it got picked up by Verizon Fios, which was on on standard net network television. So I was very proud of that. And you know, um, you know, I think it's something to consider that we need to seriously take uh, control of our narrative mm -hmm. and tell our own stories. Make sure that our stories are the good ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would actually um, I agree, but I, I want to balance out that conversation and say that um, our our panel today kind of we have a, a, a Caribbean focus of of, of Latinos. <clears throat> and I think when I, when we think of Latino, Latinx, um, it, it branches out to obviously our Mexican brothers and sisters and our Central American and South American brothers and sisters that do go through traumatic experiences that, that aren't visible because um, just America doesn't, you know, highlight um, their goods um, or their bads. So they're, they're completely invisible. So... I do agree that we need to uh, definitely tell our stories, good stories, but I, I don't think it's a bad thing to really highlight the atrocities and the things that are happening to our to our um, countrymen and, you know, and South and Central Americas um, and the Caribbeans as well. Um, you know, one mm -hmm. of them being the children in cages. Right. That's a that, you know, that's that's a big one that should have gotten a, a bigger response. And mm -hmm. um, and there was a loss there. I see it as, you know, a loss for us that um it's still happening you know and um that's the that's the unfortunate thing so um those other groups um are, are making noise and i think it's it's wonderful thing um i support all of those groups and i think mm -hmm. it it does it should highlight to the latinx community that it is possible for us to organize the same way and and we should and um as well as put out our good stories because I, 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 we need that balance. You know, I'm not negating what, what, uh, what my brother said. So I'm just, uh, there's a balance in everything. I guess that, that makes me wonder then, do you think because Latinidad is so vast that that's why we continue to stay invisible? Do you think it's like, like, yeah, right today it's like, there's a, it's like, if you focus on the Caribbean, people are like, uh, what does that mean? Let's just go back to what we know. Do you think there's a fear that people are like, ah, uh, okay, they're not cleaning houses. Audiences aren't going to understand what's going on. Yeah, on the contrary, oh, sorry. Who, no, go ahead. I, go I was going to say, on the contrary, I think that's where we're falling short, right? Mm -hmm. I feel that um, because we have different Latinx cultures, that there is a need to preserve nuestra cultura separately mm -hmm. because we're all at risk of losing our cultural uh, values and traditions being Americanized, but um, what happens is, is we tend to operate separately when in fact we, we have more in common, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think we need to examine further. You know, I mean, um, we, we all speak Spanish, we, we have our different foods, but yet they're kind of the same. They have different names and or we all speak Spanish with different dialects. And um, if we were to join together, truly mm -hmm. as a Latinx or Latino or Latina nation and just focus strategically on organizing how to influence our own progression, we would be so powerful because there is power in numbers. Right, and if we knew our shared history a lot better or even a little bit better, we would see, I mean, we're all ex-colonized people. We all have this Spanish colonial baggage as well as this African heritage and this indigenous heritage. Mm -hmm. So we do, we need to understand all the things that unite us, wrap our head around the fact that better and stronger is going to get us further and then figure out ways to work together. But working together is hard. It's a lot of work. It is, it is, especially because we're, we're still trying to figure out who we are. Because again, going back to, you know, that colonized, colonized mentality and walking around with, you know, carrying that oppression, it, it, it becomes questionable uh, as to who we are, uh, especially like myself, I'm third generation, you know, I'm born and raised here. 
So um, I learned my cultura through time. It wasn't, I wasn't necessarily born into all of it. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that too. For me, you know, it, it took, it took me well into probably my college years to really start to figure things out and identify mm. with, with the path that I wanted to take, you know, as an individual, but also as an artist, but it started as an individual of, of like, where do I fit in? And that's where I brought up these institutions in, in New York, these Puerto Rican institutions and, and organizations that helped me figure that out. You know, that, um, you know, when I went into New York and Poets Cafe and, and hearing the poets cadence of how they spoke, mm. it, it, was, it was familiar to like what, how my family spoke, you know, and having conversations during parties and things. So uh, the names, you know, Maria's and Kuka's and Junior and Lefty <laughs> and like all these random, you know, nicknames, <clears throat> I've never heard in any other uh, context other than in these places. And um, it, 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 it goes back to like the, the invisibility, but also invisibility and accessibility. I think if we, if we don't have these places that are accessible to us, mm. um, we, we, it's harder for us to navigate the world because then we, right. we are, we're connecting to something small that, that we might seem, that we might connect with that's familiar. Um, for a really quick fact for me, it was, I was connected to Native American culture very early on when I was a kid with my mm -hmm. art. I loved like the, the, the Native chiefs and the artwork. And I was just fascinated by that. But I didn't know the history of the Taino culture, that we had that within our own culture. So mm -hmm. I think through that education, through um, and only through the accessibility of having our places that teach us about these things. Correct. Um, where it, where it uh, you know, highlighted it for me. But I do think that the vastness of, of uh, the Hispanic community, you know, just um, it's really difficult for for us to come together because we are so different yet you know we have the common language and mm. and it's a com we have to make a serious concerted effort to support each other um, uh, in in every which way whether it's culturally financially um, you know just emotionally uh, but we have to go out of our way to do it because obviously on a natural basis everyone just keeps going to their own little uh, mm. The clicks and the enclaves, and 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 you know, Dominicans over here, Puerto Ricans over there, Mexicans over there. You know, but it's it's more than that. We just have to really work together a little bit more mm. in, in mutual support. You know, I don't know why everyone's so upset. We have Hamilton, guys. We have Hamilton. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Well, so I I think this brings us to you know, Raquel. I wanna I wanna bring this to you in terms of talking about progress being so slow. You know, you mentioned education, and Adrian mentioned access. What do you think are the factors that have contributed to the reasons why like progress has just been so slow for Latinx artists? Right. Well, I think things are so slow on so many levels because there's institutional racism and there's structural mm -hmm. racism and it's meant to be that slow. And I'll just use a metaphor as Hurricane Maria, for example. Why did it take nine months for electricity or why did it take, you know, so long for tarps and why are people now starting to finally get FEMA funding? It takes a long time because they don't want these things to happen. And it's very kind of counterculture to some extent that we get these spaces. And if you go back to this colonized people, what do they do is they take your voice and they take your story. With the Taino that Adrián brought up, you know, in Puerto Rico, they just stopped counting them one day. They had a census and they just decided to stop counting Tainos. And then you read in the, the history books that the Taino disappeared. They didn't disappear. They just began to stop counting them, which could tie us into the, you know, ridiculousness we just live with this past census and how many people weren't counted which means you don't get the support which means new york just lost a representative you know like how do you silence people you just freaking ignore them which is what we've seen and what we're living so well yeah <laughs> and just lastly really quick with al museo yeah. I work at al museo once upon a time and the history of al museo was that parents and educators came together to make that space. And it was a big fight. And it was first in an old, like abandoned firehouse. Now it's on Fifth Avenue and it's beautiful, but it was a big struggle. And, you know, to some extent, it continues to be in a struggle to have these spaces. And we have to continue always, always to fight for these spaces. Well, you say, Walter, you, yeah. you, you've, made your, you've made your own space, yeah. 
Well, you know, I, I'm actually working on on a great project with uh, with uh, Raquel, and it's uh, oh, uh, an that's... animation. Uh, we okay, animated. Okay, plugging. We're plugging. We're plugging ourselves. <laughs> no, but the, the reason the reason I bring it in is because we we have to tell our own stories, and and uh, the progress 100%. it can only be done by us understanding where our our past. So when you think think about children's uh, stories, and you think about think about all these. Um, uh, the tales of, of Cinderella, Pinocchio, Hansel and Gretel, you know, they're all Eastern European stories told, you know, and, and retold by Disney uh, and written in thousands of books. So, you know, we're just trying to um, figure out how to take some of the uh, Latino, Hispanic uh, folk stories and be able to bring those to light so that we know our own folk, folk tales. And, and, you know, and if anyone else wants to retell them, at least it's ours, and we're not sitting there retelling the story of Pinocchio, and we're not retelling the story of of uh, Cinderella, uh, which which are cute and everything, but it's not ours. Mm. And and um, you know, it starts that simple. It starts when you're four or five years old, when you start owning your own your own past, and once you know where you've been, and and you know, uh, even if it's just through simple storytelling, then it's easier to figure out who you are, and then and then. Uh, forge your own uh, path forward. Mm -hmm. So those are the little things that we're doing. And, you know, just uh, with Raquel and I through the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, we're, we're trying to at least put our little bit in a granito de, de arena <laughs> into all of that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I like, I'd like to add to that, actually. Um, You're not allowed, I, again. unfortunately. <laughs> oh, man. I, it's, probably, it's probably because my video keeps cutting in and out. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're doing um, great. All right, cool. Um, no, I, I actually, I, I did the same thing. So I, I agree with the rest of the panel of like starting young and educating our kids young. Um, I created a book series called Caras Lindas. Um, the first first book is highlighting our Puerto Rican visionaries. So it's people from our Puerto Rican history, Puerto Rican culture from the Albizu Campos that everyone claims to to know the history of him and know who he is, but our we start young, and I was one of those people. I start older, and that's one of I was one of those people. Um, it's a it's a book um, for children, but it's there it goes. Yes, it's this book exactly. for children. <laughs> yeah, but I was gonna add and say, that's but, awesome. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of adults. Um, this is where we're kind of getting our introduction to to these people. Um, the Felicitas Mendez, the uh, Rafael Cordero, and and these these people who were who influenced um, and 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 were visionaries and had milestones of our of our history and culture that that changed a lot of it. Um, and I have the second book is uh, dedicated to El Grito de Lares, so it's telling the stories mm -hmm. of of the people that were a part. So all of it is just learning about the people that were a part of these. Um, moments in our history so it's not really storytelling yeah. it's actually just like factual book of of uh of our history yeah and then i can piggyback off of that and say oh my god i'm the documenter i'm the person who captures everybody's stories i'm that mm -hmm. outlet in which everybody comes to to jump off and or introduce their their new project and i've been doing it for 15 years now and mm. um and i continue to do it and i love doing it because I feel that um, we're, we're short in that department. And so while I do mm. it for a network, I also went as far as creating my own production company, my own media company, and I do it through various outlets, through newsletters. I have my yeah. Arena del Barrio newsletter. I um, offer it through social media, I have a team, and, um, and we do the best that we can to amplify everybody's voice. Um, however, going back to what I originally said, um, there's only but so much I can do if the support system isn't backing me up. It's like everybody right. comes to me to assist them, but I don't know if we realize that it, it's you know there's there's reciprocity that's required because that their their numbers right their following assists the following that I already have versus them right. to me looking for my following. Right. So can I just ask, Rena, based off that with our, our final like five minutes here, you guys have been providing already some tangible solutions as to what like we can do as artists to start becoming visible. But I just want to sort of bring this conversation to a fold by talking about what are tangible things like Waldo, uh, what are tangible things for you 
that you think people can do to uh, help reverse this invisibility? Well, I think, you know, it, it just pick, going back to what I, what I said about it, and even what Adrian was saying, you have to see the, the, the sacrifices that those before us made. If you're mm -hmm. able to watch a documentary, read a book, and, and, and see how, how, how uh, people put their necks on the line for voting rights, for, for bilingual education, for, for those things, uh, things were not always the way they are, you know? And even mm -hmm. for them, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it is what it is, things are what they are. Well, they're not. You don't have to accept your current circumstance and, and you know, um, just because something is the way it is doesn't mean it has to be like this forever. And if you get that ins inspiration from someone in the 60s and the 70s and the 50s, um, you saw what they did and you say, you know what, it can be done. I can get up. I can I can be a, the, the agent of change. And mm -hmm. so that's why it's important to, to see those documentaries and read those books so you can right. step up and do your part. Again, what about you? Tangible takeaways, one minute or less, go. Sure, I'm doing a project now with Iris Morales, a former young <laughs> board um, through her house, Red Sugar Cane Press, and it's about the 1969 garbage offensive. So with the young, former young lord, we're telling that story. I'm doing it with a woman with her own editorial house. So just like we've been saying, working together with our people. And I have Adrian's beautiful book here. We support each yeah. other. We say beautiful things about each other. We make beautiful art with each other, just like we are doing and we have to continue to do. Yeah. Um, I do want to give everyone a chance, just because Adrian and Rina, you guys did give some solutions already. And I think a lot of what we've been talking about is access to education make a platform for yourself, you know, continue to network. So I just want to give you guys an opportunity to give final remarks, you know, as we're coming to an end uh, for this panel. Well, I say, make, you know, tell your story and don't be shy because if you don't toot your own horn, no one else will. And that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's the story, you know, you got to tell your story. Yeah, I, I, and I think supporting one another. Um, like Raquel said, like Reina said, like Waldo, it's it's just making sure we support one another, um, support our institutions, support the local bookstores, support the local bodega, whatever that we can mm -hmm. support each other, um, support your friend that's trying to do something and they may not have the proper network or the uh, resources to do it. Do whatever you can to kind of help because um, like everyone's been saying, uh, we need to tell our own stories. Nobody's going to tell them better than us um yeah and 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 we also have to hold all of everything that i just said hold those people accountable as well so making sure that if the stories are being told and we're allowing our own people to tell the stories make sure that we're holding them accountable to telling the story correctly um our institutions making sure that they're uh, uh giving the space for us to speak the way we should mm -hmm. the way we should be represented properly the boards, the all of that stuff, it should be all, um, we should be represented in, in every space and every aspect of this process. And I think, I think that um, in supporting each other, we should definitely uh, support each other in all genres and um, we should be carrying each other's history and making it our business to learn about each other's histories. And um, mm. Yeah, and in order to also, I also feel that in order to transform our future, we we really need to know our past. But when we speak about our history, we should really be mindful of speaking about it from an accomplished perspective because that mm -hmm. gives power to our cultural existence. Mm -hmm. And Raquel, final, final thoughts. Take us home. For sure, like as a PhD and give you all homework. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies and, you know, look at some of the materials we have. Ask people to share their stories with you. And then just mm -hmm. like, we got to do the work. Like, you can't expect people to support you if they've never seen you before. There, we have mm -hmm. institutions, but you can't just pop up and, you know, expect a lot of love. I think everyone on this panel has spent many, many years cultivating that relationship with people. It's not easy. None mm -hmm. of this is easy, but it's joyful. And lastly, what you all are doing to give this space for high school students, that's something beautiful. We need to, you know, demand that and have the money and have that platform and promote it. Because if it's just this token thing, it doesn't stick and it doesn't happen. So do the work. 
joyfully, joyfully. Joyfully. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Well, listen, I just want to thank everyone for being here, for speaking on the panel. I mean, some takeaways for me is I got to get a library card. I got to start reading. Okay, I got to get educated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but I think um, Michaela Cole says it like this, which is if it's not written, it's already erased. And so I think having this panel, we are bringing conversations to the table. We're bringing our bodies and voices to the table. And in a way, we are reversing erasure because we're saying it and we're writing it. So you know, I want to thank everyone again for being here. This is, we've had uh, Adrián Román, we've had Lina Valentín, Wal Waldo Cabrera, and Dr. Raquel Ortiz. This is Conversations Among X, and today specifically we're talking about addressing invisibility amongst Latinx creative. So I just want to thank you guys again. I want to thank HITN and Cine Youth for organizing this. And then I obviously want to thank the audience, because without you guys, this would have just been so much weirder so so weird to know that we were talking to no one um but thank you thank you all again i've been lorena and you know what we have more panels i know what no one sleeps here no one sleeps but you can find out more at cineyouthfest.org and we're having another one wednesday may 19th at 4 p.m great stories in another genre storytelling through murals and that'll be with jesse fuentes and whoo if you had a good time with me you'll have a better time with them Thank you guys again so much. We're going to leave you with uh, our sponsors. What? Yes, we have sponsors. So thank you so much again and have a wonderful Wednesday. Oh, that's my alarm. I have to go. <laughs> Thanks to our sponsors, we continue to have important conversations that educate and inspire the most valuable asset for a brighter future. The new generation of Latinx creatives. Visit CineYouthFest.org to find out more, because tu cuentas. We all have a story to tell, and your story matters. Now more than ever, that's why we've created Cine Youth Fest, A cinema festival and a platform for independent voices, positive change, stories of heroism, from the lens of a Latinx experience. Join the adventure on our website, CineYouthFest.org. There, you will find all you need to participate in the competition. The rules of the game, Latinx and film, where you find out how important we really are. Classes behind the camera with people who know. Stories from others like you who have a dream, big ideas, and awesome goals. Raise your voice to be heard. Show off to be seen. And be part of history sharing your story. Lights, camera, acción. Because tú cuentas. Powered by Ache y T N.
Thanks to our sponsors, we continue to have important conversations that educate and inspire the most valuable asset for a brighter future. The new generation of Latinx creatives. Visit CineYouthFest.org to find out more because tu cuentas. We all have a story to tell and your story matters. Now more than ever, that's why we've created Cine Youth Fest. A cinema festival and a platform for independent voices, positive change, stories of heroism from the lens of a Latinx experience. Join the adventure on our website, cinayouthfest.org. There, you will find all you need to participate in the competition. The rules of the game, Latinx and film, where you find out how important we really are. Classes behind the camera with people who know. Stories from others like you who have a dream, big ideas, and awesome goals. Raise your voice to be heard, show off to be seen, and be part of history sharing your story. Lights, camera, acción, because tú cuentas. Powered by HITN. Adrián Viajero Román's work is informed by issues of race, migration, and identity, while exploring both the personal and historical memory of the two disparate worlds that he inhabits, the tropical landscape of Puerto Rico and the overpopulated cityscape of New York. His practice combines drawing, painting, sculpture with an immersive installation environment, composed of objects collected from different communities, from salvaged wood and window frames to historic artifacts and vintage photographs. The resulting environments can fill an entire wall or an entire room and often incorporate sound and aromatics that draw upon the history and memory embedded in these objects. He is interested in the continuity of time and in how these interventions may bring these living histories forward to the present. Adrián Viajero Román is a time traveler. Puerto Rico. Dr. Raquel M. Ortiz is an anthropologist, educator, and award-winning children's book author. Her scholarship focuses on the visual arts, culture, literature, music, and identity, and includes El Arte de la Identidad, Aproximación Crítica al Jibarismo Puertorriqueño en la Literatura, La Música y las Obras de Arte, in the documentary Memories on the Wall, Education and Enrichment Through Community Murals. Her first picture book, Sophie and the Magic Musical Mural, published by Arte Public Press, was named an ILBA, Best Educational Children's Picture Book. A number of her books explore music and culture, including Sophie Paints Her Dreams, that features merengue music, and When Julia Danced Bomba, a junior library guild selection. Her newest book, Vicky in a Summer of Change, shares what happened in East Harlem, New York, in 1969, when members of the Young Lords organization united with El Barrio residents to make positive changes in their neighborhood. Rina Valentin, nicknamed La Reina del Barrio, is a native New Yorker of Puerto Rican descent and a television host focused on lifting human-centered stories with an eye towards fostering empathy and community bridge building. A beloved spokesperson for her community, she is making a mark in New York City's entertainment industry for her unique approach to advocating for and celebrating diversity. Born in East Harlem, Rina, a longtime community resident, is wildly known for her work since 2006 as a host of Bronx Nets Open Friday, a recipient of the 2020 All-Inclusive Changemaker Award and a 25 Bronx Influential Women of 2015 Award. Rina is the founder of La Reina del Barrio, Inc. A fervent practitioner of transcendental meditation, Rina is an active supporter of the arts and believes that the underpinning of the economic health of a community requires support for small and local New York businesses. She also uses her platform to shine a light on pressing social issues, such as domestic violence and holistic mental health needs. Presently, she is part of a fundraising initiative for STEAM educational children's programs in Puerto Rico, Colombia, and West Africa. Recently, Rina Valentin was the first Afro-Latina woman to be named New Yorker for New York. April was her month. 
Waldo Cabrera is a two-time Emmy-nominated journalist with over 30 years of professional advertising and marketing experience. After getting an advertising degree from Syracuse University, Waldo joined 4Kids Entertainment, the company that brought Pokemon to the United States. In 2009, Verizon added Waldo's online news program to its Fios One news channel. Over an eight-year run, Waldo produced over 1,200 episodes that focused on outstanding people in the community. He continues telling the stories within the Hispanic community as the head of the media unit at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Cooney Hunter College. Thanks to our sponsors, we continue to have important conversations that educate and inspire the most valuable asset for a brighter future, the new generation of Latinx creatives. Visit CineYouthFest.org to find out more because tu cuentas. We all have a story to tell, and your story matters. Now more than ever, that's why we've created Cine Youth Fest. A cinema festival and a platform for independent voices, positive change, stories of heroism from the lens of a Latinx experience. Join the adventure on our website, cineyouthfest.org. There, you will find all you need to participate in the competition. The rules of the game, Latinx and film, where you find out how important we really are classes behind the camera with people who know. Stories from others like you who have a dream, big ideas, and awesome goals. Raise your voice to be heard. Show off to be seen. And be part of history sharing your story. Lights, camera, acción. Because tú cuentas. Powered by H I T N. Thank you.